Okay, now, you know, it's, well, just let me just clarify a couple of points. Apparently last week I said God brought the drug movement on. Um, it's just a slip of the tongue. Obviously Satan who's brought the drug movement in <laughs> as a way to kind of get people into the realm of spirit. Alright? Now if I say something like that, you know I don't mean it, alright? <laughs> okay. <laughs> It's just a slip of the tongue. <laughs> you people were throwing about Nostradamus. You know, I talked about Nostradamus. That um, it's um, found a way into the spirit realm. You could understand some of the things that God was purposing to do. Let me just clarify that. There are many pathways into the realm of the spirit. The spirit world. Quote. There are many pathways. Jesus said in, in, in John chapter 10 and, and verse 9... He said, I am the door. No man gets into, into, the, into the kingdom of God except through me. He said, by me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. There's only one doorway to the kingdom of God. There's only one doorway to be saved. But he went on, you know, in, in John 10 and verse 1, he said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth in, not by this door, but he still enters in. He that entereth in, not by this door, but climbs up some other way. Talking about the spirit realm. Who enters in, not by the door of Jesus, but climbs up some other way, the same as the thief and the robber. Okay, we're talking about John 10, verse 1, and John 10, verse 9. But Jesus said, I am the door. I am the only door into the kingdom of God. There are many pathways into the spirit realm. Um, the term, we understand the term heavenly places, simply refers to the realm of spirit, good and bad. Heavenly places, uh, the realm of spirit, the fourth dimension includes heaven, heavenly places includes hell. It's just unfortunate to use the name heavenly places. Um, the Greek is the, is the heavenly, which, heavenlies, which is the word that's used for spirit world or spirit realm. Um, includes, heavenly places includes heaven, hell and all in between. And we know from Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 10 that there are fallen angels and demonic powers in heavenly places. So it's not just a place of heaven. Uh, Ephesians very clearly makes it clear that there are fallen angels, principalities and powers which reside in heavenly places. The Bible tells us in Ephesians 2, 6, we are seated with the Lord in this realm, the realm of spirit in heavenly places. You know, people try to think, well, I'm seated in heaven with the Lord. But really it's not saying that. It's saying we're seated in the realm of spirit. Our rank is higher than the rank of principalities and powers. The redeemed human being has a higher rank in the heavenly places, in the spirit realm, than principalities and powers, if he knows it and if he believes it. If you don't believe it, it is not so, because everything works by faith. That a redeemed human spirit is of higher rank in that realm of spirit, in heavenly places. We are seated with the Lord. That's a much higher rank um, in, in heavenly places. The Bible tells us in Ephesians 1, 3, all of our blessings are reserved for us in heavenly places, in the spirit realm. Okay. Now, so, we need to understand, um, you know, that, that kind of thing. Um, some things are held in secret by God. They are yet to be revealed. Many things God has not revealed into the earth yet. They're held in secret. I believe this generation is going to uncover incredible secrets of God. Incredible, like we, we, incredible things. Um, those things which are revealed to us, those things that have been revealed from heaven through the prophets or people through Revelation and so on, uh, are open to the human spirit. They are released into the spirit realm. Okay, they are already there once they've been released. Deuteronomy chapter 29 and verse 29 says, The secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but those things which have been revealed belong to us, the human race, and to our children forever. Okay, now Nostradamus was not a Christian. It's obvious if you read about his life, he didn't know the Lord Jesus, didn't, didn't know him, he was not a Christian. He had no access to the kingdom of heaven. Okay, but he had access, he found pathways into the spirit realm. He was able to get into heavenly places, he was able to find access in vision form and many other ways 
into the spirit realm. He had access, if you like, to the realm of eternity, the spirit realm, and to those things that have been released in the spirit realm. And he could access through principalities and powers and demonic spirits, uh, uh, you know, he could access principalities, powers and spirits who had limited knowledge of the purposes of God. So he would get some things right. He would get many things wrong. He could read off in the realm of eternity things that are already released, uh, past, present and future, and he could access that. Um, but he was not born again. The thief climbeth up some other way and ends in deception and hell. But there's only one doorway into the kingdom of God, and that's through Jesus Christ. So we, I just wanted to clarify that and give us some understanding um, of that. Okay, how do we walk in the realm of God? The kingdom realm, the kingdom of God. Okay, if you have your Bibles, come to the book of Romans. Okay, because we're going to... Um, and, and Romans chapter 8 we'll start with. Just keep your Bibles open, open to Romans chapter 8. We're talking about the new creation man. Romans chapter 8, in the first verse, begins with, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Okay. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Alright, there is no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk after the Spirit. Okay. Stay in Romans, but I just want to quote a scripture from Galatians, Galatians 5.16. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Talking about victory over sin. Walk in the Spirit, and you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. Galatians 5.16. Galatians 5.25 If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Okay, 1 Peter 4 verse 6 For this cause was the gospel preached unto them that were dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh. Now this little phrase, and live according to God in the Spirit. Live like God in the Spirit. There are many other scriptures, but that's just a few. How do we do that when it relates to sin? We're talking about now relating to sin. The new creation man, your spirit, relates to the spirit realm very, very easily. Um, the new man is in God's image, in seed form, is in God's image. All of the DNA of God is in that seed. You have to turn out like him. That's the new creation man. When you're born again, your spirit then has to grow up into God. Okay, your spirit is not perfect, it's perfect in seed form, but it has to grow. It speaks of the Lord Jesus Christ in Luke chapter 2 and verse 40, it says, The child grew and waxed strong in spirit, became strong in spirit, okay? Filled with wisdom and the grace of God was upon him. Luke 2 verse 52, it says, So then Jesus increased in wisdom and stature, it's in spirit, and in, the fa and in favor with God and with man. So his spirit began to be strengthened and grow. Okay, that's talking about Jesus. The child grew, not just physically, but he became strong in spirit. Okay, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature, and would favor with God and man. Okay, now in the natural, it takes a long time, relatively speaking, to grow up. I'm talking about physically, emotionally, and all of those ways. It takes a long time to grow up. Um, you know, and um, not so in the realm of the Spirit. Aren't you glad you don't have to wait 30 years to grow up in the realm of the Spirit? You can grow very, very quickly in the realm of the Spirit. Your Spirit can mature. When Jesus was the age, by the Jesus was the age of 12, he was confounding the religious leaders in Israel. And it says the child grew and waxed strong in spirit while it was still a child. Okay, so a spirit can grow up um, very, very quickly. When you're, you're born again, you 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 regenerated, regenerated spirit, you receive the nature of Jesus. And let me just clarify something here. I'm trying to lay foundations for us. You receive the nature of Jesus. That's the fruit of the spirit. What's his nature like? Love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, meekness, kindness, all of those things. The fruit of the Spirit, you receive his nature. That's what he is like. That's who he is. That's in you. He, that's in your spirit. Your spirit is like that. You're cloned off him. 
Okay? A seed is in him. But let me say something. That alone is not enough. It is not enough. Um, your new spirit needs to be clothed in the power of God. See, it is not just love. It's very frustrating to love someone and not be able to help them because you don't have the power to help them. See, people say, well, all you need is love. Then love. It's not enough. You need power. And so, uh, we need a new created man, a new spirit that has the very nature of Jesus, but it needs to be clothed in the power of God. Okay. Clothed in the power of God. Luke 24 verse 49 Behold I send the promise of my Father upon you but wait in the city of Jerusalem and tell you what? Be endured, covered with the power from on high. First, 2 Timothy 1 7 For God has not given us the spirit of fear but of power. The spirit of power. You need a spirit of power to rest upon you. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is that you are immersed into the power of God. The new birth, you have the nature, okay, the fruit of the Spirit. In the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you are clothed with His ability, His power. You know, you know a person by two things, their nature and their ability. That's how you know a person, basically by two things, what they're like, their nature, and what they can do, their ability. Now, that whole, the wholeness of Christ has to come to us in this way. The baptism of the Holy Spirit, you are immersed into, and it's internal and external, you are immersed into the power of the Holy Spirit, the power of God. So we have love, or the fruit of the Spirit, and we have the power of God, the ability of God's Spirit. Now, you know, your human spirit is not complete just because you were born again. You have his nature. But you need his ability, you need his power. And, you know, Jesus didn't need to be born again because he had a perfect spirit, right? But he did have to be endured with power. His human spirit, which was perfect, like yours when you are born again, had to be clothed in power before he could work the works of God and help people. It says in Acts 10.30 how Jesus was clothed with the power of God, anointed with power, and went around what? doing good, healing all those who were oppressed of the devil. He had to be clothed in the power in order to help people. Okay, two factors here. His spirit needed to be clothed in power. And so we have the story of Jesus in Matthew 3 verse 16. It says, And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened upon him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending upon him like a dove and lighting upon him. That was a new experience for Jesus, okay? The Holy Spirit descending upon him like a dove. Okay, now, the issue, when we talk about power, you know, you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, okay, and it's like, it's the immersion of the Holy Spirit, you were immersed into the Holy Spirit, and, um, you know, it's like, um, people say, well, is the Holy Spirit in me, or is the Holy Spirit upon me? Okay, um, well it's like a glass of water, you can take it and drink it, and it's in you. Or you can get into a swimming pool out of your deck, and it's both in you and around you. Okay, now that's the concept of immersion, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, it's both. But we need to look at this. Um, when Jesus, the power of God came upon him, it wasn't released in his life. This is really important because people are baptized in the Holy Spirit but the power of God is not released in their lives and there's a reason for it. Okay, and um, he was baptized in the Holy Spirit but he wasn't, that, that anointing of power did not manifest itself, did not flow in him, through him, rest upon him until he could prove to the Father that he could be trusted with power. Let me say that again. You receive the Spirit, but the power of God, that anointing of power was not manifest in his life until, and only until, he could prove to the Father that he would, could be trusted with that kind of power. It's really, really important. So, we see he came out of the water, 
uh, baptism, Luke chapter 4, 1 says, Now Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, but the power was not resting upon him to be released for miracles and healings and so on. He says, Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned to Jordan and was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness. Okay, notice the phrase there. Full of the Holy Ghost, but no power manifest. It's not Acts 8.38 is not, you know, Jesus anointed him with power, with the Holy Ghost, and with power. Two things. Now, the purpose of the temptation of Jesus when he went up into the wilderness was simply, or was centered around the independent use of power. People say, well, you know, where was Jesus tempted in the wilderness? He wasn't tempted for you and I. He would go to the cross for you and I, where he was in the wilderness proving that the Father could trust him. And he went through some quite severe tests there, you know. Um, and the, the question was the independent use of power, whether he could be trusted with it. He's hungry, he's been fasting 40 days, he's hungry. The enemy comes, Satan comes and said, make these stones bread. Now, you know, it wasn't a matter of ability. But he said, make these stones bread. And, you know, and what was his reply? He would not do it because he was subject to the Father and the Father had not said, make these stones bread. And so he came straight back to the enemy and he said, you know, man shall not live by bread alone. He said, I only live by every word I hear my Father say. He said, my Father hasn't said, make stones bread, so I'll go hungry. Okay? The independent use of power. And so he passes that kind of first test. Now we can talk about these and these lasted a long time. These weren't just five minute tests. These was in the wilderness in great conflict with the enemy. And he could have failed. Otherwise there is no point to, to the temptation. Okay? You say, but he was Jesus, you know, he would have got on alright. Okay, there's no point to it if that was the case. He was back, he was the first of the Adamic race all over again. Would he fail? Okay? Okay, now, man shall not live by bread alone. He said, I only listen to what my father says to me. My father has not said, made stones bread. I don't live by your word, my word. I live by his word. Okay, next, um, takes him up into a high mountain, shows him all the kingdoms of the world. And it says, and the power of them. He said, see all of these kingdoms? He said, and the power of them I will give to you on the condition that you'll worship me. Okay, all of the kingdoms of the world and the power of them. He said, I'm going to give this to you. Okay, so it brings up the question, why do you want power? You know, fame, fortune, recognition, acclaim. His reply was, I will, only, I will serve God only and only God. You see, when you, have, when you serve self, I'm talking about Christians now, spiritual Christians, self, ambition, pride, a desire for power to advance us, Satan will grant it to you. Let me just say it to you, Satan will grant it to you. The motive is wrong. Now, Satan will grant it, deception moves in, and the gifts we have from God remain the same gifts, but they become powered from another source, demonic. The gifts are the same. But the powering of them is different. You see, and we can go for a long time, but if God does not, cannot deal with our soul life, he steps back and we keep operating in the spirit realm without God. And naturally plugged to the other side. So he's dealing with heart, he's dealing with attitudes, and um, he's dealing with, you know, all of these things. He said, if you, if you bow down and worship me, I'll give you all of these now Jesus knew that one day he was going to receive all of the kingdoms of this world. The kingdoms of this world shall become the kingdoms of our God and his Christ. Daniel tells us that. But he has to wait for that. Could he wait for that? He could have had it right there and then. Power. So he takes him up to the pinnacle of the temple next. Okay? Pinnacle of the temple. A great audience below. And... Uh, you know, he says, okay, you say you are the Son of God, you're the Son of God. Prove it now to the people that you're accepted by God, you are the Son of God. Cast yourself down. And the angels, you know, you can have faith, you believe God, the angels will bear you down. 
to the ground safely. Quoting from scriptures. Now, so there's another kind of pressure now. He was saying, prove who you are by the use of your power. Prove who you are by the use of your power. Force the hand of God. Presumption. He said, thou shalt not tempt. That word tempt is put the Lord to a test. You will not tempt the Lord your God. Put to the test. He said, I will do only those things I see the Father doing through me and with me. So he's going through these tests, you see, and uh, proving. You want the power of God just to prove that we are Christians? You see, why do we want power? These things had to be settled. Independent use of power. It's an extremely dangerous thing to give a high-powered automatic weapon into the hands of a novice. Extremely dangerous. You know, if he gets a fright, he's going to pull the trigger. He's not going to identify the enemy possible, properly. And, and, you know, a lot of the, the, the casualties in the Gulf War were under casualties through what they call friendly fire. They were taking out each other's helicopters and, and, and tanks because they weren't properly identifying the enemy. They had enormous power in their hands. Okay? And, um, you know, why do we want power? Can God trust us with it? And so before Jesus was released into the world with the power of God, he'd been baptized in the Spirit, the equivalent, he was full of the Holy Ghost. But before he could be released into the world, he had to prove to God he would not use this power independent of the Father. That's a very important factor. Because I have known evangelists who've had the power of God upon their lives and moved in the gifts of the Spirit and seen many, many people saved and many, many miracles and... Uh, finally began to do their own thing and to get out of flowing in God and adjust the purposes of God began to play with the anointing do all kinds of things and they switch into another spirit the independent use of power so Jesus had to prove this you see to the Father and uh, when he came out so he comes up out of the baptism he's full of the Holy Ghost and it's full of the Spirit, full of the Holy Ghost, when he goes up in the wilderness. When he comes out of the wilderness, there's a different phrase used. It says, now in Luke um, 4 and verse 14, after these temptations, these tests in the wilderness, it says, now Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit. He went up full of the Holy Ghost, but he returned in the power of the Spirit. And it says, immediately his fame, his fame, went throughout the whole region. One of the most dangerous points is when you become famous in anything. <laughs> That's your most dangerous time because it just takes pride to rise. His fame, but he knew his source, everything. He was linked into the Father. He could do, he would do nothing of himself. Okay, now his fame, he was moving now in tremendous power. You see, I believe that many baptize the Holy Spirit, be full of the Holy Spirit, but still don't move in that anointing of power because their soul life is not dealt with. You see, there is so much waywardness, pride, desire for acclaim, touching the glory. So, it's really, really important. We need our spirit clothed in the Holy Spirit through the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We need to be baptized in the Spirit. Your spirit then is clothed with the Holy Spirit and it begins to grow strong in the power of His Spirit. Jesus grew strong in spirit. And the child grew and waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom and the grace of God was upon him. Speaking of Jesus, it wasn't just Jesus. That terminology was used also for John the Baptist because... In Luke 1, 80 it says, And the child grew, and it's talking about John the Baptist now, and waxed strong in spirit, and was in the deserts till the day of his showing to Israel. Talking about John the Baptist now, his spirit waxed, became strong in the Lord, strong in God, waxed strong in spirit. So, the new man has a nature, the fruit of Jesus, uh, the fruit of the Spirit, the Spirit of Christ. Your new created man needs to grow, needs to be clothed in the power of the Holy Spirit to grow strong in spirit. So we're talking about two aspects now. To be born again, you have his seed and you have his nature. You're going to be just what he likes. But that is not enough. It's not enough to love if you don't have the power 
to help, to set free. Okay? So he said, that's not enough. The nature is not enough. He said, wait until you be clothed. Your, your new created man has to be clothed with power from on high. Alright? And, and the power of the Lord then has to come upon us and through us. And so the new man has the fruit of the Spirit. Through the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the new man then begins to move in the ability of the Spirit of God, the power of God. Now, we know that when you speak in other tongues, you strengthen your spirit. When you worship God, your spirit enlarges very quickly when you worship the Lord. The Lord talks a lot, of, the scripture talks a lot about being enlarged in God. How many of you know, and thank goodness, it's not your physical body. <laughs> <laughs> it's your spirit he's talking about being enlarged in God now worship enlarges your spirit all you have to do is stop and begin to worship your spirit and your spirit grows just instantly grows ok speaking in tongues building yourself up praying in the Holy Ghost if that praise in an unknown tongue edifies the Greek word builds up your spirit it's like being in the gym you know for the physical body well, when you pray in tongues, that's what's happening to your spirit. You become strong in your spirit. And uh, you need to do that. You need to exercise these spirit, these realm, these things of the spirit. Worship. Enlarge your spirit. Empower your spirit. The stronger your spirit is, the more it takes dominance over the soul. You know, when I'm praying for people, sometimes their spirit is so small within them that I can hardly find it. Uh, they, they have just never meditated on the word they don't pray they don't pray in the spirit they don't spend time in the presence of God they don't worship and that seed remains as a seed it's not watered and it's not fed and it remains as a seed the life of Christ doesn't bloom in their spirit the seed doesn't germinate doesn't come forth because they don't feed it they don't water that seed they don't expose it to the sun the presence of God you see, and quite often I pray for people that got problems, but their spirit is so emancipated. And it's a new created man, but it doesn't grow, it's still a child. You have to grow strong in the Lord and the power of his might, you see. And uh, speaking in tongues builds up your spirit. Paul said in Ephesians 3.16 that he would grant that he would grant you to be, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with the might by the spirit in your inner man that's your inner man you'll strengthen that inner man you don't strengthen it you're not going to come forth it's too weak to come forth okay you're strengthening your spirit enlarge yourself in God and uh, we talked last week about you know the, the thought of Peter his shadow that was that his spirit was so large many many times bigger than his body that when he passed down the road and people got caught in the overflow of his spirit and the dynamic of God in his spirit, they were healed. They passed through his spirit. The word shadow is it just is, is not the kind doesn't give that English word doesn't give the right. It means an eff effulgence, an outflow, a shadow, but it's an outflow, um, a virtue, enlarging your spirit until your spirit is enlarged in the Lord and um, dominant you know you're, 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 we do tend, tend to draw circles you know kind of spirit then soul which is a bit bigger then bigger and it's because it's a kind of the best way we can draw it um, you know it's like a scan a cat scan looking down it's like you know spirit soul body is spirit in the middle then your soul and then your body well that's true to a degree but if you're strong in the Lord your spirit should be much bigger than your body you see it should be much greater um, and it should cover all areas it must have dominance um, over all areas and so it's be strong in the Lord in the power of his mind in the inner man so Jesus was full of the Holy Spirit when he came, went up into the wilderness when he proved to his father that he could be trusted with power he returned in the power of the Spirit and instantly his pain went abroad in the earth ok what happened? You know, there are two words for the anointing in, in, in 1 John chapter 2.27 It says you have, a need, you have received and the anointing that remains in you And you have need, no need that any man would teach you But you know all things We're familiar with that scripture in 1 John um, And it's talking about an internal anointing of the Holy Spirit 
And um, we need to understand that, that Greek word there, 1 John 2, 27. And uh, it, let me just read it to you. But the anointing which you have received of him abides in you, and you don't need any man, any that teach you, but it's the same anointing teaches you of all things. It is a truth and no lie. It's your conscience, touches your conscience. Okay, the anointing which you have received abides in you. When you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, your, your spirit is clothed in the Spirit of God. We know that. It's clothed in the Spirit. And you have an anointing. Your spirit knows when something is wrong or right. Touches your spirit, touches your conscience, you, you know that, okay? And the Bible talks about that internal anointing. But it also talks about another anointing. Another kind of anointing in Acts chapter uh, 10 verse 38. It says how that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power. Then he went around doing good, healing all those who were oppressed of the devil. Okay, now, the word there, anointing, um, is a different anointing. In 1 John 2.27, the anointing that abides within you is chrisma, the Greek word chrisma. And it, seem, it means, it's a word, that, it's a Greek word which means to, to abide, to rub into you, to rub into your spirit. But, the word that's used in Acts 10.38, how God anointed Jesus, it's a Greek word which means to gently touch the surface of the body. Just to gently touch the surface of the body. Or to slightly rest upon it's a different anointing we're talking about when Jesus went up into the wilderness he was full of the Holy Ghost when he came out of the wilderness he came out in the power of the Spirit gently resting upon there is an external anointing it's not just internal there is an external anointing which comes upon us and when that comes upon you it touches your soul as well as your spirit and your physical body you can, and and it, it happens by an anointing that comes over you. Now, now, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, that internal infilling of the Holy Spirit, is a grace gift and it's free and it's, you can receive it by faith, but the anointing over you is going to cost you something. The Pentecostals, Charismatics do not understand this. They say, I'm filled with the Holy Ghost, I'm ready to go. Okay, I've got it all. Hallelujah. Jesus said, whoa, 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 whoa. Let's go in the wilderness for a while and see if I can trust you with this. That's the difference. The anointing costs us. If you lose the anointing, you've got to fast and pray to get it back. Did the Holy Spirit go anywhere? No. Did the, the anointing on the inside leave? No. But your external clothing did. And you've got to fast and pray to get that 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 creo, that external anointing, back upon us. And that's what happened to Jesus. You see, when he came out of the wilderness, now he was clothed in that externally with the, the spirit of power. And for that to happen in any real measure, yeah, you have to be in a position where your soul life, where your soul life has died and there's no independence left in it. When you reach that point, we talk about dying to self, this is what we're talking about. Independence. That's what we're talking about. Dying to self. Uh, independence. Can you be trusted with it? The soul must be servient to the spirit. To walk in the spirit, we have to walk in the, the faculties of the recreated spirit, which through the baptism of the Holy Spirit, links our spirit to him. Walking in the Spirit requires two things. It requires a sensitivity and it requires a choice. And I'll kind of work with you on that shortly. But a sensitivity and a choice. Now, there are many aspects of walking in the Spirit. There are many aspects. I'm dealing today with one aspect only, okay? Uh, in the area of overcoming sin. People have got to stop trying to overcome sin. Because as long as you are trying, you are never going to make it. Okay? Stop trying to overcome sin. You say, well, I'm not going to lose my temper again. I'm going to make my mind, I'm not going to, I'm going to grip my teeth, I'm going to count to ten, and I'm not going to lose my temper again. You know, you've tried all those kind of things. Stop trying to stop sinning. 
It doesn't work that way. We heard about the word grace. What does that mean? You can't do it. That's simply what grace means. You can't do it. So why try? And I didn't, I'm not abdicating you for all responsibility. Just, 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 I'm not into false doctrine here. Just hold on a minute. Okay. Walking in the Spirit, you see, Ephesians 6.5, if we've been planted together in the likeness of his death, that's in the soul areas, the independence areas of our life and selfishness, we shall also in the likeness of his resurrection. Now, let me just say, when Adam sinned, you were in Adam. We talked about this last week. You were in him. Because every human being was in Adam. The seed was going to come from him into the earth. That's not the son. Second son was a murderer. It's already there. The seed was flowing. And it was the very nature of Satan because 4,000 years later, Jesus said to the Pharisees, He said, You are of your father, the devil. And he said, also, he said, The, the devil was a murderer from the beginning. What was he talking about? Cain killed Abel? Uh, and, 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 and it was he was who was nature was that Lucifer's where did he get it from Adam and all the way down the family line the, the human race is not lots of people it's one tree one tree only okay now you didn't have to we talked about last week the fallen nature a child is born into this world it doesn't have to try to be bad it is bad Sorry if you're pregnant, but you've got it ahead of you. <laughs> that little child is going to defy you. <laughs> and it's going to require, spare the rod and spoil the child. It's going to require some real discipline to keep it on track. Okay? Because it is going to, it doesn't take long before kids start defying you. They'll stand up against you. Isn't that incredible? Where did they get that from? They didn't learn it. Where did they get it from? It is in them. <laughs> got it from mom and dad. <laughs> Not just ma'am. <laughs> the problem is you can't pass on your recreated spirit. <laughs> Everyone has to choose for themselves. The kid doesn't have to try to be bad. It is bad. It, by nature. When you are born again, you are now in Christ. You don't have to try to be good. You are good. Stop trying. Okay? If you start trying, you're going to get into the flesh. Humanism, psychology, and all the other kind of rubbish. Okay? In the realm of the flesh. Now, having said that, when Jesus died, you were in him. When Adam sinned, you were in Adam. Jesus was the last of the Adamic race. He took mankind, past, present and future, took it into himself in the realm of spirit and died, brought that race to an end to those who would believe. Always it is to those who believe. Otherwise it's not real. In the spirit realm, it has to be by faith or it's not activated. So he brought that race to an end. Jesus, the last Adam, took mankind, past, present and future, and died and brought the race to an end to those who believe. So, when you're born again, you have a new nature that cannot sin. How, the question is, how do you let that new nature live through you? That's the thing. Okay, turn with me to Romans chapter 6, in the book of Romans. Romans chapter 6 through Romans chapter 8, those three chapters deal with this, pro this problem. How now are we going to live in the spirit? How are you going to let your spirit man come to the fore? Because it's perfect. How are you going to let him come to the fore and live through you? How do you let the new nature live through you? Okay, Romans chapter 6 and verse. What shall we say then? Shall we continue, continue in sin that grace might abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead, we've been put to death in Jesus, to sin, live any longer therein? Know ye not that as so many as were baptized into Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we are buried with him in baptism unto death. That like as Christ was raised from the dead to the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we've been planted 
together in the likeness of his death we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection so he said now know this know it that your old man, your old nature, the way you were, the kind of person you were in Adam has been crucified, has been put to death that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth you, you should not sin but he that is dead is freed from sin let's just stop for a moment here this is talking about baptism, it's talking about water baptism, okay so you come into the kingdom of God, you're born again by the spirit of the Lord now, he's saying that water baptism is a very powerful thing because in essence, it's talking about a step of act of faith and obedience to God in acknowledging that that old nature is dead and that when you ri ri rise from that watery grave you're going to live and activate and live in the new man. Now that's what water baptism is all about. But when you take a step of faith and obedience to God, something happens in the spirit. Something becomes real. Something is activated. The promise comes into action. You see, now, understanding this is very, very important. Let me just say this. In the book of Acts, they baptized people immediately, like Jeff was saying the other day. They baptized them immediately. They were born again. However, however, and there is a however, you get back past a few years go by and Paul begins to bring a revelation of what it is about now they didn't know in the book of Acts what it was about there was just an act of faith and obedience but about 60 years later Paul the Apostle comes on the scene he said hey I want you to understand what you're doing in baptizing these people he said this is what happens when you baptize them and when we baptize people today we should either strut them immediately before or immediately after what Paul teaches here so they, they can take hold of it in faith See, the revelation wasn't in the book of Acts it was in, and not until the book of Ephesians and Colossians until this began to come forward and so it's talking about an act of faith knowing Reckon. And so Paul says, okay, you, you baptize in, in water and, and it's an act of faith that the old nature is buried in this watery grave. When you rise from this baptism, a new man is activated, you're going to live in him. Resurrection life and resurrection power. So he says, after saying that, he says, so, know this, that your old man, you see, your old nature has been crucified with Christ. This is revelation knowledge, know this, it's, it's a word which means knowing, it's in the active tense. It's a participation, knowing. Knowing by revelation, not just head knowledge, but knowing. Knowing this, know that the power of the old sinful nature has been put to death. If you know and if you believe, it has been put to death. Legally in the universe, Satan has to obey it. It has to be obeyed in the realm of the spirit. It is a legal fact. The old nature was put to death. Okay. The power of the old nature has been cancelled legally. You have to know that and you have to believe it. It's got nothing to do with how you feel. Your feelings are fickle. Don't go by them. It's got to be what God says. It's not how you feel. You say, well, I don't feel righteous. It's got nothing to do with anything. Yes, new created man is righteous. Can't do anything to make it more righteous, it is righteous. Made in the image of God. Okay? Now Paul says, okay, just know this, that the old recreated, the old man has been put to death legally, to legal fact in the courts of the universe. So he says in verse eleven, he is his toe. You can count upon that. Reckon. The word reckon here is to count upon. Reckon. So likewise reckon unto yourselves to be dead to sin and alive unto God. Your old nature and your new nature is alive unto God. Reckon, count upon it. You can count on it. So what do you do? Because you know that your old nature legally has been put to death and your new man is alive unto God. There's one little thing you have to do. Choose. Choose. No word that both say choose. Choose. Who does the choosing? You. You do the choosing. Okay, you're going to choose who's going to live through you. Is the new man, the recreated man, going to live through you? Or is the old nature going to? You, you have the choice now. You're confronted with sin. 
you have to choose. He said, well, I'm going to try not to do this. No, 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 no. You're going to choose who you're going to let live through you. That's all. If you try, you'll fail. Now, how are you going to choose? You just choose. So, he goes on in Romans 6, verse 13. He says, okay, now you Christians. He said, don't yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness. What's your members? Your mouth, your mind, your hands, your physical body. Don't yield these as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves to God as those who were what? Alive from the dead. That's your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. So you're confronted with a situation. Who are you going to allow to live through you? You stop. There is a choice. Okay? There is a choice. You confront it with doing something wrong and you know it is wrong and there's a, sin has power. And you're going to say, well, the old nature, legally, the power of it is being broken. I choose for my new nature in the likeness of Christ to come forth. And that choice empowers your spirit. Just the choice. Just to say no to the old and yes to the new empowers your spirit. Your spirit waiting there for that which way is he going to go. And as soon as you side with Christ, you say, you're going to yield your hands, your mouth, your tongue, your mind, everything. As an instrument of righteousness, you're going to allow your new created man to handle this situation. As soon as you make that choice, your spirit is bigger than you. It's cool. He's empowered. And he automatically lives, handles that situation for you. It's not you trying not to sin. It's choosing who is going to live. Who you're going to allow to live through you. As soon as you choose, you empower him. But you have to choose. It's a conscious thing. He said, don't yield these things to the old nature. Yield them to the new creation spirit in you. Let that come forward. Dead to sin and alive unto God. Choose who's going to live through you. Don't yield yourself to these things. Because then Paul goes on to say, Romans 6, a few verses later, 16. He said, it's important for you to know, know ye not, that whomsoever you yield your servants to, you yield your members, your hands, your mouth, your mind, your mind, all of those things, every area of your soul and your physical body, who you yield to, his servant you will become. Slave, in other words, you will become. You'll yield it to the old nature, you'll become a slave or a servant to it. If you yield it to the new nature within, you'll be free in Christ. Slave to the new nature. Now, he said, whomsoever you yield to, his servant you are going to become. Okay. So, in Romans 8, and verse 1, it says, Now then, there is no condemnation to whom? To those who walk not after the flesh, after the old. But if you choose to walk in the new man, you will not sin. And there is no condemnation. Okay? Because you don't sin. But the choice is yours. It's a conscious choice. After a while, that conscious choice becomes a way of life. And it's not so much a conscious choice, it's because it just becomes a way of life in the end. But you have to start by choosing, activate your new creation man. And to bring him to the fore. You see, people coming all the time and say, I think I need deliverance, I've, I've got this, I've got that, I've got the other, and this. No, you, most people don't need deliverance, they need to die. And they need to let the new creation man come forth. You know the easy way to get rid of demons is to starve them out. They'll soon be rattling their cage, you know, saying, let me out of here. You know, and, and just starve them out. Live in the new creation man. There's nothing to feed on. Demons need flesh. They need the old nature to survive on. If you don't provide it, they're going to leave you real quick. You know? They're hungry for flesh. You know, dust shall be the, the serpent's food, as Isaiah said. Yeah, the flesh. They say, don't eat, don't give them any flesh. And they, they're going to find someone else. Okay, they need flesh to survive on. Deny the flesh. Put it to death. This way. Okay. So, he said, no condemnation if you walk in the spirit. If you walk in your new recreated man, allow him to come to the fore by choice. You won't sin. Verse 4, that the righteousness of God might be fulfilled in you, 
Who? Who walk not after the flesh, the old man, but after the spirit, the new man, the new creation man, walking after the spirit. He said, if you're carnally minded, naturally minded, try to do these things yourself, you'll die. You'll never ever overcome. It's by grace, not by you deciding that you're not going to sin anymore. It's by deciding to allow a new nature to live its life through you. You've got someone on the inside who is perfectly righteous, who is just waiting to live his life through you. Made in the image and the likeness of God, empowered by the Holy Spirit, but the choice is yours. The choice to walk after the flesh, the old nature, or after the spirit, the new nature. You know? So you don't have to try to be good. You are good. You just have to let the person who is good in you, your new created spirit, your spirit, live through you. In union with the Holy Spirit. If you do that, then you'll have victory over sin. You'll walk in the Spirit. Uh, you will walk in the light. A new nature. You don't try to be good. You are good. But you have to choose which one is going to live through you. A power is released when you choose. The law of the Spirit of life in Christ sets you free. There's a law there. When you choose, another law comes into operation. The law of the spirit of life in Christ sets you free from sin. Hallelujah. You don't have to walk in it. You walk in the newness of life. New nature. That's a power there. There's no more condemnation for the law of the spirit of life has set you free. Okay? Spirit of life is released through you. Puts to death the old nature. So Romans 8.13 says, For if you live in the spirit, you live after the flesh, you will die. But if through the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body. How do you do that? By allowing the new man to come forth. When that new life flows, the old dies. It's a choice, you see. If you live in the Spirit, let's walk in the Spirit. Put on the new man. Choosing. Colossians 3, verse 12 says, Put on, therefore, mercy, kindness, humility of mind, meekness, Long suffering. I mean, you know, that's a hard one to put on. Long suffering. Okay. This is the nature of Jesus. All these things, fruit of the Spirit. You see? Mercy, kindness, humility of mind, meekness, long suffering. When you can't put up with the person anymore, you have to stop and say, I'm not going to yield my mind, my body, my tongue to that old nature. I'm going to choose for the new nature of Jesus to come through me now. That's all it takes to empower you. And it's amazing how long suffering you feel. Because it's not you. <laughs> Patience is the same. All of these things in the realm of the Spirit. You see? Put on these things by choosing to allow the Lord to come through. In Him you are complete, the Bible says. Complete. All that He is, He's in you. You don't have to have any more. You are complete in Him. And so, the first stage of walking in the Spirit is learning to allow that new creation man to come through and overcome sin. If you walk in the Spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. But if you don't walk in the Spirit, no matter how you try, you're going to continue to sin. Because it's by the grace of God. But if you walk in the new nature, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And it is a choice. And then you're empowered. Walking in the new man. Hallelujah. So you live in that recreated spirit. Now in that spirit, because you're joined to the Lord, you're one spirit. And then when you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, there are other things clothing that spirit now. There's the power of God in the inside. And I'm talking externally. We have gifts of the spirit. We're talking about the ability of God. We have the mind of Christ. He's a joint to the Lord. Our spirit has the mind of... Your spirit is extremely intelligent. Your spirit is joined to the mind of Christ. Unlimited. It's just our own natural mind gets in the way. And when what's coming through in the spirit doesn't compute with what our mind is being told, you have a short circuit. It doesn't get through. So your mind has to be renewed. In other words, it has to think how God thinks. Simple as that. To renew your mind is simply to think how God thinks. So there's no interference from the new creation, the new recreated man 
often wants to come forth, but he gets this far and hits your brain. And your brain says, no, get down, that's not so, it doesn't compute, that can't be it, that can't be real, I don't believe that. And the new creative mind goes, <laughs> down inside again. This gets recreated, this gets renewed. You see, you become one, your spirit man becomes one with your soul and your body. The world is going to beat a path to your door because you're going to be a manifested son of God. And so the whole of creation is waiting for a manifestation of the sons of God. When your new created man is in harmony with your soul and your physical body, your walk as Jesus walked. Hallelujah. But the anointing only comes when you die to self. Only comes when independence has been laid down. What we want is laid down subservient to what he wants and he said then this is the son of God I can bring him into sonship I can clothe him in my power we have only touched a, a small portion of the power of God there is recreation power that God wants to release to this generation like never before I mean the power of God where limbs are going to grow out and the power of God when Down syndrome is going to be healed in an instant the power of God, recreative miracles are going to come forth like never before. But I want to tell you, if you had that kind of power, it would probably destroy your life. It wouldn't be able to handle the claim, the pressure, the pride it could generate, the money it would generate. You imagine the money you could make. The thing is, you don't know. Once you start, you can start out right, but then you can slip back into ambition and pride and money making and kingdom building. And the Holy Spirit says, no, I don't want any of that. I'm coming away from that. But your gift is still there. And it becomes empowered from the demonic. And you're still a Christian. And you're still charismatic. I was in a meeting where this, this evangelist was, was performing signs and wonders and the word of knowledge was moving and, and, and they knew it wasn't the Holy Spirit. There was a famous evangelist in Australia. But I knew he wasn't moving in, in, in the Spirit of God, he was moving with demonic power. And I decided that I was going to bind those spirits in that meeting, take authority over them and bind those spirits. And I began to bind those spirits. A number of people would, began to bind those spirits. Instantly, he couldn't operate in it. So they stopped the meeting. They have a conference with all the pastors. They come back on the scene and they came to the conclusion that somebody was praying against them in that meeting. And so it was, uh, you know, we were at an impasse. What concerned me was the 20 pastors there on the platform didn't discern it. And uh, ambition, pride, kingdom building. And I want to tell you, that spirit came against me in that meeting so powerfully that it took me all my strength to stand against it. They closed the meeting in the end because he couldn't operate in it. But what concerned me greatly that everybody thought it was the power of God. Can you be trusted with power? That's the issue that God is after at this present time. God wants to bring an incredible revival, another healing revival, another power revival. But he's saying, you got to die first. No independent use of power. When I can trust you, I will anoint you. Nothing to do with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You've already got that. But when I can trust you, I will anoint you with power. And it's better that God deals with us now, so that then it doesn't destroy us. And if God looks at you and says, you know, you don't know what you're asking for. He said, for your sake, I'm not going to give it to you. But he, his heart aches because there's a healing, hurting world out there which needs this power. I want to challenge you today. God's looking for a generation of sons of God. Mature sons of God. Who are coming forth in his likeness, in his limit, image. Who will walk in the power of the Spirit. Who will walk in the Spirit. Who will walk from their Spirit's faculties and walk with him in the Spirit who dealt with all those stupid things like kingdom building and power and money and acclaim and what people think. They dealt with that. They're dead to it. Doesn't mean anything to them anymore. They died. 
And sometimes to get us dead, God has to put us through some terrible things. Because we don't take the easy route. So God comes on his plan B. Whack! <laughs> and he said, God, why is everything gone wrong? And, and you're not with me anymore and I pray and there's no answers. God just waits. So you come to the end of self-dependence. And so you finally say, God, I don't have anything of myself. I can't do it. I don't have the ability. I don't have any. God says, now you're talking. Let's put some of these things to death once and for all. You've got to keep it dead by walking in the Spirit. When God gets a people and he's looking for a people today whom he can trust. So you have the nature and you have love God, and God is essentially love, but love is not enough. It will not heal this hurting generation. We need the power of God, the ability of God. I want to challenge you. There's a generation coming, going to come forth in the power and the ability of God. And they're going to be clothed with power from on high. And we're going to see tremendous things happen. You see? But it's the grace, and it's grace alone, to walk in the Spirit. You will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. You've got to learn that first. Who you yield to, his servant you will become. We have to allow by choice the new nature to come forth and live through us. But there is a call of God across this land. There is a call of God across the world now for sons of God to come forth. In varying, and they earn their degrees in that but to come forth. Why is God holding things? Because the next move is going to be a move of great power. Recreation power. But he said, goodness me, we've got to have a people who can handle that. A people whose soul has been put to death, independent use, been submitted to God. People who will not touch the glory and say, look what I'm able to do. Look what I have done. I'm not talking about it with the body, I'm talking about it with the heart. Because we don't normally say those things with our hearts. We don't, with our voice, we only think them on the inside. But that's just as dangerous as saying it. And God is saying, when I get a people like that, you know, hallelujah, hallelujah, you know, when a person has cancer, sometimes they, they have to use so much radiation that almost kills the patient in order to kill the cancer. You know, they use chemotherapy and other kinds of stuff, and quite often they can't kill the cancer because the measure, the level of, of what is needed would kill the person too. The, the level that's needed to kill the cancer would kill the person, and so they're in a dilemma. But you see, when God looks at a problem like that, He kills the patient deals with the problem and raises them in life again. Okay? The only thing that God is after right now is killing you. That's the only thing he's concerned with. He wants you dead. Dead to self, dead to independence, dead to, 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 to your own ways. When he gets to people who are dead to themselves, then resurrection power will come upon them. And the spirit of power will rest externally upon their lives. That spirit of power is a very, very powerful thing. It hasn't given us the spirit of fear, but the spirit of power. You see? So that's the recreation power of God. In the 1940s, it was a healing move. 1948, incredible healing move came right across the body of Christ. In the late 1990s, it is a miracle move. And a, and, a, and a level of deliverance with such power that the world is going to stand in awe. You're going to have people and the insane are going to be delivered overnight. We're going to see tremendous power release for deliverance and healing and restoration and life. Let me just close in this. John G. Lake at the turn of the century was one of the I guess it's one of the greatest ministries at the turn of the century. He influenced my life. His books influenced my life, I guess, more than any other. Great man of God. And he was so sensitive to the Spirit of God that um, he could take hold of a person and, 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 tell, and, and tell them 
what the disease was, how long they'd have it, what caused it, and pray for it. Pray for that person. He was so sensitive. He just had to touch the person, and his spirit man knew everything about them. Okay? He began to play with that. He began to go into hospitals. He began to play with it. He began to Skype to the doctors. He lost it. And he never got it back till the day that he died. And it was it. It was it for the rest of his life. He tried to get it back. He was still a great man of God. But that level, that area of his life, God took it out. Why? You see? Independent use. And uh, he is still a great man, great healers. Hey, in Africa, in one state, he was praying for the sick for so long, and there were great miracles. And he began to preach a message to the people about Jesus as being the rock of our salvation, the rock out of the Old Testament and the rock in the New Testament. And he was so tired and praying for the sick, and there was a great rock there. And he said, this, God wants to give you a, 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 a demonstration. He said, I want you to understand that Jesus, you're not coming to me, but Jesus like this rock. And he laid hands upon this rock. And he said, it's like this, Jesus is the rock. He said, God's going to give you some signs and wonders to teach you that you're not coming to me. I have no life, no healing, no power in myself. If you get healed, it comes down upon me and through me and heals you. And I have nothing to do with it. And he laid hands upon this rock and went home. And for three days, the Africans came to that rock. They brought the dead. The dead were resurrected as they touched the rock. They brought the sick. They brought the demon possessed. They touched that rock. And for three days, then it was gone. Otherwise, they would have made an idol of it. But God was saying, you know, you see, that kind of attitude, this healing has nothing to do with me. It has nothing to do with my righteousness before God. The power of God comes upon me flows through me and you are healed if God doesn't do that you won't be healed I have got nothing to do with it humility of mind you see and we've got to really God wants a generation that will flow with him got any questions? no you can't Yes, yes. I think that occurs when you learn to walk in the Spirit. But, because we don't do that all of the time, God allows things in our life to highlight things, to bring us to the end of ourselves, until we run out of our own endeavours. <laughs> and that's usually the route we go, unfortunately. <laughs> but it's both. But we have been put to death. You can't put yourself to death. You can only choose. That's the only thing you can do. Any other question? Mm. Where does repentance Okay. Repentance comes when we... Repentance is a choice as well. Okay, it's an act. When God touches your conscience, when God touches your heart, and there is sin, when you're becoming more and more sensitive to walking with the Lord, you should begin... Now, repentance comes after you have sinned, not before. Okay, so walking in the Spirit, you will not sin if you choose right. But once you have sinned, it requires repentance. And repentance simply is to, is a, is a godly sorrow for sin. It's a gift, but it's also, also a godly sorrow for sin. But it's more than that. It is turning from it and walking in the other direction. And sometimes repentance requires restitution. For instance, we had a move in the 70s where lots of kids were the, the hippie movement. Many of them had been into all kinds of things and they get saved. God forgives all of their sins. But it was on a weekly basis. I was walking with these guys down to the police station and they'd have to tell the police what they had done. Some of them went to jail. And I remember one week I was down four times to the police station with these guys who were getting saved. Now, that's, rest, that's a form of repentance. It's restitution. It's another degree of repentance. Putting things right. Some things you can't put right. But where you can put it right, you do put it right. And if you don't, you don't get free. <laughs> but repentance, again, is after you have sinned, you have to repent. And depending on what kind of thing it is, you know, it, it's... Repentance is a funny thing. We can be sorry because we got caught. 
and that's not repentance. All right? Um, we're talking about a hard thing towards God. We have sinned against God. And it shuts you out from God. And if God doesn't forgive, God doesn't come through, you're not going to really restore it back to God. You've got to repent. Essentially, the word means to turn around and go in the opposite direction. Okay? But it's after the act. Walking in the Spirit, hopefully, you don't sin because you learn how to walk in the Spirit. But if you do sin, we have access to the Father and the blood of Jesus. Okay. Anyone else? So where is actually the work of repentance? I think it's done in the areas of their soul, primarily. Primarily in the area of your soul. Um, so what does it mean when it says, not laying again the foundations of repentance by going on to perfection? Okay, I think, I think there are two things there. I think, one, it's dealing with, there was a gospel called Gnosticism in a time when Paul spoke that and it had no repentance in it. It was salvation without repentance. Now, but we've almost got back to that in the body of Christ today, you know. Um, but there was laying that foundation, the proper foundation for repentance, for salvation. There's, there is that. But, but also I believe that we come to a place where we don't have to lay that foundation again because we walk in the Spirit. And so you're saying that we'll never suffer with that thing if we truly repent, then we will never do that thing again? Oh no, it depends on the depth of the repentance. But there if it's true repentance, but there's, there's, we always have a choice to go back if we wish. But if the power of that thing should be broken. And the thing is, the level of the repentance determines the power, that the power of that thing being broken. Um, you know, it, it's... You're saying godly sorrow is a gift? Godly sorrow is a gift. Timothy talks about the gift of repentance. You see, and Jacob couldn't find repentance. You remember, he couldn't find rep- Esau couldn't find repentance, and uh, it was um, it always sorted it with tears. It is a gift. It is the grace of God. But you say, well, I can't repent. God gives me the grace. It, the Bible talks about taking words and going before God in repentance. If you do that then true repentance will come. The gift of repentance will be imparted. It's like, yes, you take a step of faith to start to repent, then the true gift will come. Um, it's, uh, and, and free you from that thing. It's, it's, everything is the grace of God. All we have to make is a choice. It's like w- walking in the Spirit. It's like worship, you see. It's like uh, we worship God and we start to worship, but we're not in the Spirit yet until we get into a flow. And then we get into the Spirit. That repentance, you start to repent by taking words and actions and start to repent, and God will give you the gift of repentance. You see, it comes that way. If you don't start, it will come. Very rarely, sovereign. You have to do something. Start to repent. Yeah. Yes, of course. Um, Trying to think of a scripture that says that. Um, uh, look it up. If I have my computer, I can find. It. But it talks about <laughs> it talks about um, not praying for certain people. They're past it. Yeah, that can happen to over nations too. And God spoke to me once about New Zealand not to pray for it in, in, in the eighties. I wasn't to pray for it anymore. And it went into incredible decline. No matter how much people pray, it wasn't going to change what God intended then. Yeah. 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 You know, it's, let me just say something. It's very, very hard to lose your salvation. You have really got to work at it. Um, It's difficult. If you work hard enough, you might achieve it. But it's really hard to do. <laughs> but you can lose your salvation. I do not believe that doctrine once saved, always saved. The Bible doesn't teach that. It says, no man can pluck you out of the hand of God, but you can walk out. 
You see, and you can pass a point where you cannot get back, particularly spiritual Christians. You see, but that's hard to do. It's it's not easy. You've really got to work on it to get to that point. Amazing how gracious God is, and it is amazing who I say will be surprised. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Because dying to self has nothing to do with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. One. It's to do with what Jesus has achieved for us upon the cross. Okay. Now, when a person walks in, is born again, but they're not baptized in the Holy Spirit, they are joined to the Lord. And he's joined to the Lord. He's one spirit, and they have a measure of sensitivity in their spirit. But when you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, two things happen. One, that is greatly increased, greatly increased because your, your connection is much stronger. And secondly, there's gifts imparted. Gifts of the Spirit come with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, let me just say this. Let me just say this. How can I say this without confusion? Okay. A person can be clothed with power and not baptized in the Holy Spirit. person can be clothed externally. You take some of these guys, Moody and some of those guys, they weren't baptized in the Holy Spirit like you and I, internally. They didn't speak in tongues, but they had an incredible clothing of power. It had nothing to do with that. It had to do with their sanctification and their call of God upon their life. Faith. You see, but when you baptize in the Holy Spirit, two things happen. Internally and externally as you yield to the Lord. The external major is to do with your but it's your yieldedness to the Lord and you, there's a cost for the anointing that's different to the baptism of the Holy Spirit you were baptized but now you have to have an anointing now when I stand up here I feel an anointing it's anointing to minister it's got nothing to do with the baptism of the Holy Spirit I can be not baptized in the Holy Spirit and still feel anointing many of those guys did the turn of the century and they weren't baptized in the Holy Spirit but they had an anointing but they didn't flow in the gifts of the Spirit you see, you know, it's a little, you've got to separate the baptism the internal and the external clothing of power. The two different things. Okay? And, um, but the person can be not baptized in the Holy Spirit, but their spirit can be sensitive to God and people around them and sensitive because they've they're, they're, they're just learned to walk in the faculties of their recreated spirit. Okay? But when you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, much more is imparted. Uh, yeah. mm -hmm. That's right, that can happen. Yeah. I don't know where Billy Graham stands. I don't know if he speaks in tongues or not. Everybody argues over that. But I want to tell you, when that guy stands up, he has an anointing. And he has, when he stands up to give an altar call, I mean, it is the simplest altar call you could ever think of. He said, well, come forward. I say that, nothing happens. <laughs> he stands up there and says, now, come now. And a thousand people stand up and come. An incredible anointing that with the guy. And angels, now I don't know his position on baptism, but he's been baptized in the Holy Spirit. But um, he has a ministry gift. But the ministry gifts do not come to their fullness until you're baptized in the Holy Spirit. Okay. The ministry gifts are different. What happens? Oh, I don't know if you're ready for that. <laughs> ministry gifts are nothing you do with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. When a ministry gift is operating in ministry, the Lord comes up behind him and steps into him. And that ministry gift is a gift of Jesus to that body at that time. And after the meeting, he steps out of him. When this closes, the Lord will step out of me. It's always backwards. And my ministry gift's not operating. It's a different thing to the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You see, it's the, the, the two different Greek words that's used. When he gave gifts to men, the person was the gift. The, baptism, well, the gifts of the Spirit are different. The Holy Spirit are gifts. But when it talks about ministry gifts in Ephesians, the person themselves is the gift to that body because it's Jesus is the gift in them. And that the Lord comes and just steps into that person 
and the ministry grid to operate. When the meeting is over, when he's finished ministry, the Lord will step out of them. You say, well, I thought I had the Lord in me anyway. Your recreated spirit has everything that the Lord is. That's how Jesus is in you. But there are times when the Lord will come and step into you. When a prophet is ministering, the Lord has stepped into him and the Lord is that prophet. That's why it's serious not to hear what God is saying, because it is the Lord speaking. See, if we receive a prophet, you see, in the name of a prophet, you receive a prophet's reward. You know, and so that's how these things operate. They are ministry gifts of Christ. The gifts of the Spirit are gifts of the Holy Spirit. Fivefold ministries are gifts of Christ. The gift of the person of Christ through that person to the body. It's a different operation. You understand what I'm saying? Am I confusing you? <laughs> yeah. Mm. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> now, <laughs> there's two. I'll tell you something. Look, your spirit has to be strong. So you must pray in the spirit. You must expose your spirit to the word. Your spirit and worship. Your spirit must be enlarged. Then you have to learn to walk in the faculties of your human spirit. Now, your human spirit can do everything that your physical body can do. And so you must learn to move in your spirit when you touch a person. Um, we are spiritual beings. We need to be aware of spirit being, of each other, in the spirit. And so we, we exercise our spirit. We learn to become conscious of our spirit. Instead of learning to walk in the natural all the time, we learn to walk in the faculties of the spirit. Now, you can do certain things. You know, the simplest things is your, because your spirit is joined to the Lord and knows all things, okay? You're driving down the road, the traffic lights up ahead, you say to the Lord, your spirit, okay, when I get there, will it be red or green? What do you say, spirit, in me? And you listen to what he says. He knows everything. He's joined to the Lord. Now, so what you're doing, you're exercising your spirit. By reason of what? Use. When you go shopping, ladies, you use your spirit. Okay, you're looking at something and you say, your spirit is joined to the Lord, knows everything. You say, can I get this cheaper anywhere else? He loves to work with you that way. He'll tell you just the right shop to go to, the right place to go to. He's interested in those things. Okay, this works in making money, works in investments, it works in every field of endeavor. You become spiritual people. Becoming aware of your spirit. For instance, people are not aware, like, it depends, we've been worshipping today, so your spirit should be a little least increased. Um, you take your hands like this, we're doing this with the young people, you take your hands like this, okay? Bring them real close together. Now, when you get to a certain point, you'll slightly feel slight heat and resistance when you get to a certain point. Just feel that? Just heat? Could be close enough, too far apart. What are you feeling? You're feeling your spirit. Just a slight resistance. Right? Heat. Just slightly feel it. Feel it right there. Okay? There's a field, a force field. It's your spirit. Okay. You walk up alongside a person, you can feel their spirit. Okay? And the Bible says, don't know each other after flesh, but after spirit. You can only know a person, really what they're like by their spirit. Spirit. Um, yeah. Now the thing is, this tape gets a. Uh, <laughs> 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 I'm not answering that. <laughs> the thing is, this tape gets that. Everybody thinks, you know, you get you're psychic, you're in the occult, you know all of this. <laughs> but you know, come on. <laughs> the church has got to grow up. Yeah. You know, they've just got to get past this kind of mentality. 
wife's full of aura? Yeah, your aura is just your spirit. Your aura, your spirit is in, depending on what anointing, what you're manifesting is in various colors. I mean, your spirit is, your spirit is not gray, depending on what's generating in your spirit. You know, God is a very colorful person. He's, you know, light and light and vitality in your spirit emanates that. Now, cultists see that and can read off what's happening in your spirit, because they see in the spirit. Okay? And that's an, an occult function. Their spirit in, in, in connection, powered by demons, can cause them to see and move in the spirit. And they can see those things, you see. But it's just, what you've got to understand is that all power came from God. Oh boy, we're getting into something. All power comes from God. Satan's power, where did it come from? God. No, it's not. He, mis- he misuses it. That's all. He misuses it. You can be negatively charged or positively charged. And all power came from God. The occultists get into it, harmonize, sync with that power through demons and misuse the power that God gave. See, Satan misuses the power, the wisdom and everything that God gave him. You know, we have this funny thing about occultists and it's just a misuse of power. People connected to a wrong spirit connects them with that. You see, but we, you know, you got to understand that everything, everything that the occultists do, spiritists do, is a counterfeit of the real. I wish Christians could get a hold of that. I mean, you know, it, it's such a, a weird thing that they get into. And I don't know, even leaders, how they, why they cannot see that. Everything the occult does, the church should be doing the real thing. It's just a counterfeit. It's just... They, we should be doing the real thing. They pray for the sick. Should we stop praying it because the spiritists do it? They have words of knowledge. Should we stop doing it? They cast out demons. Oh, that's a cultish. Okay? And so we, we come along and we take somebody by the hand and we feel and say, You know, God is showing me when I touch you. And Christians go, <gasps> That's the occult. Now, it's so... <laughs> illogical it's hardly worth explaining <laughs> yeah well if you're if you're not called I mean you, you think there are two things I'm not clear on what I'm not sure whether it is your soul or your spirit that leaves your body I haven't worked that when I'm still open to God. Sometimes your spirit does leave. But the Bible talks about your silver cord. You know, if your silver cord is cut, you are dead. That's it. Kaput. It's over. That's the end of it. You cannot cut someone's silver cord. You, you can't. You're dead. Okay? But that silver cord can be very long. It's a life force. But I suspect more often that your soul can leave you by. It's, it's a living soul. I don't understand the full and fullness of our understanding of a soul. I do not fully understand that. But I do understand that, you know, demons can, can come. One of the greatest deceptions that's happening to people in the, in, the, in the realm of the spirit is this. Against them. person starts to move in God. You'll get a demon come along, which is an impersonating spirit. It, it, it shifts shifts into their image, it looks just like that person. It will appear to someone either in their bedroom, in seduction and so on. That person will go, ah, I saw that person in my bedroom, they were trying to seduce me. No you didn't, you saw a deceiving demon. And the easiest way to de- discredit another Christian who is moving in God is for the enemy to do this. When somebody appears to you in your room, 99.9% of the time, if it's in a negative sense, you can say that is a demon. It's not the person. It is a demon trying to discredit that person. And Christians need to be very careful with that. As I know Christians have said to me, "Oh, you appeared in my room and you said this to me and did this to me." That I said, "Oh no, I didn't. I keep a very tight rein on my spirit. I didn't. But a demon impersonating me did." And I said, "If you had challenged that spirit, it would have changed back into the demon." 
You understand what I'm saying? We've got to just wise up in the realm of the spirit. Otherwise we're going to condemn the innocent.